Welcome to Civility, Civic Action, and Youth Voices, co-sponsored by the ABA Division for Public Education and the ABA Center for Professional Development. Moderating the program today is Christine Lucianic. Christine is Manager of Education Programs and Research for the American Bar Association Division for Public Education and is located in Chicago, Illinois. Christine, please proceed with today's program. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Civility, Civic Action, and Youth Voices. Um, like I was introduced, I am Christine Lucianic, and before I introduce this afternoon's speakers, I'll provide a little bit more information about the project that has brought us all here today. So this webinar is provided through support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and is an extension of a larger grant project titled Civility and Free Expression in a Constitutional Democracy, a National Dialogue. So throughout this project, the ABA worked with partners in nine different states to develop programs that looked at the tensions between civility and free expression through a variety of lenses. Today we are joined by two people whose work focuses on the attitudes and actions that young people have towards political and civic engagement. I'm happy to have Kathy Cohen, professor at the University of Chicago and principal investigator for the Black Youth Project here with us today. Kathy's general field of specialization is American politics, although her research interests include African American politics, women in pol politics, lesbian and gay politics, and social movements. She has served as the Deputy Provost for Graduate Education and is former director of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture at the University of Chicago. She is also the principal investigator of Mobilization, Change, and Political and Civic Engagement Project. Kathy will provide us with more information on the work of the Black Youth Project, and she will share data from the recently released Black Millennials in America on the role Black millennials have played in participatory politics and their attitudes towards political and legal systems. And Kathy is also joined by Scott Warren, who is the Executive Director of Generation Citizen. Scott's passion for activism stems from his experience growing up abroad. In 2002, Scott served as an observer in the first truly democratic elections in Kenya's history, where he began to recognize the transformative potential of democracy. Influenced by his experience in Kenya, Scott founded Generation Citizen his senior year at Brown with the aim of encouraging youth to participate in the democratic process. Scott will discuss Generation Citizen's mission to provide youth with high-impact civic education through local hubs that serve as incubators for action civics. He will talk about what action civics looks like, both inside and outside the middle and high school classroom. So we will be stopping throughout the next hour to answer your questions, so feel free to type those into your Q&A box. And now, Kathy, I will pass things off to you to begin. Thank you, Christine. Thank you to the folks at the ABA and to, of course, the folks on the line uh, as part of this webinar for participating in, I think, a very important discussion. Uh, as Christine mentioned, I am the founder and director of the Black Youth Project, and so much of what I'll talk about today really focuses on uh, that project. I should say that we began about 10 years primarily focused on the question of research, and it was really about how do we monitor and record the attitudes and the actions of young people as they engage in the political process. We were especially interested in how young people of color, primarily African Americans, were kind of amplifying their political voice. So we started as a research project. We then moved on to think about communication. We had incredible findings, and we wanted to communicate that to a kind of larger audience. So that took us in a new direction. We then uh, thirdly decided that communication or amplification of voices wasn't enough. We wanted to facilitate activism among these same young people who we recognized as having very kind of nuanced and insightful uh, political analysis. And then uh, most recently, we've engaged in the kind of process of education. Uh, how do we pro provide uh, opportunities for young people to acquire the skills so that they can represent themselves um, and, in fact, kind of make sure that their policy pre preferences are pursued? And we uh, just completed a program this summer with the Chicago Public Schools. But let me tell you a little bit about uh, what we're doing now. There are really kind of three pillars to our work. We talk about them as knowledge, voice, and action. We want to make sure that, in fact, the kind of role of young people uh, in the political process 
is documented. We then want to amplify their voices, and we often talk about making sure that there's a space in particular on the web where young people can speak for themselves about the issues most important to them without censorship, although we realize there's always censorship. Um, and then we want to facilitate action led by young people and designed by young people. And that really is the kind of primary work of the Black Youth Project. Um, now, we are interested really in kind of the idea of black millennials, and we just recently uh, released a report entitled Black Millennials in America. And I'm going to spend much of my time kind of going over what we learned and what we reported in that, in that uh, monograph. The first question was kind of how do we think about millennials? I mean, Pew, for example, has talked about millennials as 18 to 34-year-olds. Um, and it's an important generation because this is a generation that in many ways this year will be, become larger in population size than baby boomers who have really defined the public policies of this country. This is probably the most racially diverse generation uh, that we've seen. This is a generation that lives primarily in urban and suburban areas, so they live differently. This is a generation that also is less likely, for example, to be religiously affiliated, and they're marrying at lower rates. So they really present a kind of different political opportunity and population for us to be thinking about. But what really drives our work about millennials is the idea that we, in fact, want to push back against the myth of the kind of homogenous millennials. Often millennials are talked about in comparison to baby boomers or some other generation. And we thought it's really important to actually disaggregate by race, by gender, and class the lived experiences of millennials that make them have very different political positions and engage in political um, projects very differentially. So that's really kind of the work that we want to do and the work we're trying to do in black millennials in America. So if we take, for example, the lived experience of black millennials, we know, for example, that black millennials uh, have a very different employment status than often young whites do. We know that the, on average the unemployment rate among young black people or among black people in general is usually twice that of white. So if we're thinking about kind of policy preferences and the fact that we see overwhelming support among black millennials for something like uh, an increase in the minimum wage, we can kind of tie that, that back to their lived experience. Um, as you can see on the slide again, we know that the educational opportunities and trajectories for young African Americans are more truncated than we see for even Latinos and young whites. If we think about something like gun violence, we know that uh, gun-related homicides among black youth are about 17 times higher than we see for young whites. If we think about you know, the, the question of incarceration and policing, I, I live in Chicago. I just watched the mayor give what I guess would be an impassioned speech to save his job, possibly. Um, but a lot of that revolves around questions of incarceration and policing in particular. And again, as you can see in this slide, over half of young African Americans report that they or someone they know has been harassed or experienced violence from the police, right, compared to about a third of young whites and a quarter of young Latinos. So we think it's really essential to think about kind of the differences in lived experience as we think about how to kind of build projects around stability and civic engagement for young people. Now, um, I'm going to get into a whole discussion of political engagement, but if people have questions about the issue, idea of lived experience, you should feel free um, to contact me or to, to send a question, but I'm going to just keep going at this point. Part of the kind of pushback against uh, the myth of the millennials, or even in this case, the youth vote, is to really pay attention to the differences in the ways in which young people, especially divided by race and ethnicity, engage in political activism. So if we take the kind of traditional standard there of political engagement, voting, we see a very different, um, we see very different numbers than would usually be indicated when we think about kind of young people as voters. First of all, there's a kind of myth of the apathetic young person. But What's really important, I think, to us is that if you look at the differences between 2004 and 2008, for example, you see growth in voter engagement among young blacks and young Latinos. The differences between 2004 and 2008 is about 8% growth for young blacks and about a 7% growth for young Latinos. And in, uh, the difference between 2004 and 2008 for uh, whites, you see a pretty stable uh, 
measurement in terms of voter outcome or, or turnout. So it's important, again, to kind of pay attention to who's turning out and who's kind of driving elections. In fact, as the slide suggests, black youth voted at higher rates than young whites did in the last two presidential elections. And that's not often a fact that is uh, discussed in the general public. If we go to kind of questions of political engagement and the impact of the youth vote, I think it's really important, for example, to talk about uh, young people of color driving the success of President Obama's reelection in 2012. Again, there is a kind of discussion of the youth vote as being attached to President Obama. And that probably was accurate in 2008 because the majority of all young people voted for President Obama. What we have found, however, is that when you look at 20, um, 2012, that clearly there was a kind of overwhelming majority of young African Americans, about 96% who voted for Obama, and about 77, 76% of young Latinos who voted for Obama, but really less than a majority of young whites voted for Obama. I think about 45% voted for Obama. So it's important, again, when we're thinking about kind of the, the preferences and the policies that will speak to young people to understand that they live very differently and they have different political commitments. Uh, it's important also to know that you know, there are significant numbers of young people of color, in particular, who were first-time voters. In fact, about 54% of young Latinos who voted in 2012 reported being first-time voters. And so while we can kind of celebrate the fact that young people are getting to the polls and they have a candidate that they believed in, um, the kind of downside, or I dare say, of voting or democracy is that many were, I don't want to we call it harassed, but at least uh, asked for extra identification at the polls. Young black voters were more likely to say that they were asked for voter identification, um, even in those states where, in fact, there were not voter, uh, photo ID laws. So about 65% of young blacks said that they were asked for photo IDs, about 57% of Latinos, and about 42% of whites. What's interesting is you look at kind of young voters in states where there are no photo ID laws, you get about 68% of blacks and 60% of Latinos still saying they were asked for a photo ID before they could vote, and about 46% of, of young whites. So it's important as we think about kind of political engagement to also think about the obstacles to political engagement that young people face. Um, let me keep going here. It's important, however, you know, to, to not only think about voting. Uh, my own work really doesn't focus on voting that much. I'm interested in the other ways in which young people can kind of raise their political voice. And again, there is a kind of narrative of young people of color not being active in those areas. And this slide is really just about kind of suggesting that when we look at things like attending a political meeting or expressive forms of political behavior like displaying a sign or a button, or even in some cases donating money, um, that young people of color, in particular young African Americans, are kind of stepping up to <clears throat> the plate to say that in fact they have things to say and that they're committed to this process. Now it will be, of course, imperative for those of us who kind of study this thing to really pay attention to 2016 because in fact there is a kind of idea that this is all about the Obama effect. That young people of color in particular have turned out to vote because of Obama. And, and I would say that there's nothing wrong with that, right? People go to the polls because they're interested and want to support a candidate. We also know they go to the polls because there's an infrastructure to mobilize them. And the question will be is in 2016, are all of us prepared to provide that same type of infrastructure to mobilize these young people back to the polls? And it just, it really isn't clear. Now, Besides the kind of what we call kind of traditional you know, ways in which people engage in politics, increasingly there's another form of political engagement that we've been trying to pay attention to. Um, we're calling it participatory politics, um, and it really is kind of facilitated through the affordances of digital media. Here we're talking about the ability of young people to kind of craft their own media for um, young people to have, to kind of avoid many of the kind of um, gatekeepers that exist in traditional media, the ability for them to kind of send messages to their peer network. Right? And this type of participatory politics is quite in line with what they're already doing online, something 
Henry Jenkins talks about as kind of participatory culture and participatory norms. So again, when we look at something called participatory politics, we see that African American youth are more likely to be engaged in those types of activities also. Um, so you know, this is this is hopeful for us in terms of the multiple dimensions of civic and political engagement and the ways in which young people, in particular young people of color, are kind of manifesting their uh, their voice in in those in those platforms and places. Um, let me just say a couple more things, and, and then I'll turn it over to Scott. You know, while we can celebrate the idea that young people are engaged in civic and political opportunities. We also want to pay attention to if, in fact, they believe that they're efficacious and if, in fact, they feel a part of the kind of larger political community. And here we usually talk about internal versus external efficacy. The, the first question on this slide is really a measure of internal efficacy. I believe that participating in politics, I can make a difference. And generally, we find that young people actually do have pretty high levels of internal political efficacy. It's really incredible that, in fact, young black people are often the ones that have the highest levels of political internal efficacy. The question of political external efficacy is about, do I believe that the government will be responsive to what I have to say? And usually we find, as you see here, that most young people believe that the government cares very little about people like me. We find this across racial groups and across gender. Um, and the second, the kind of third, uh, question here that you're seeing also says, does it make a difference which party is elected? And you know, there's very little belief that either party will advance the interests of of their particular communities. So, so what we see is high political internal efficacy, but lots of political alienation towards the um, political uh, establishment. Similarly, we also see uh, a sense of alienation when it comes to thinking about the American legal system. So when we ask the question, do, do you believe that the American legal system generally treats all groups equally, we see that just about a quarter of young blacks agree with that. Less than 50% of young whites or Latinos also agree with that. So again, there's a sense that the political establishment is really not interested in what they have to say or what they believe in. It, this, I think, really, again, points us to the significance of something like participatory politics, where people can identify, um, I would say, pockets of power, right, sites of power that might not be the traditional political system and try to engage with those, those sites of power. They might be more interested in confronting a corporation than confronting the Congress because, in fact, the Congress, they believe, is useless, right? So we want to be paying attention to the ways in which young people craft their own civic engagement and lift up and amplify their own civic voice. Okay, two last slides. Oh, no, three last slides. Very quickly. Um, we also want to pay attention to kind of how they think about um, how, how, what are the most effective means for, for creating political change. And here, and I'm not sure you can really see this slide very well, what we find is that when we looked at young people and talked to them in 2008, Lots of them believe that, in fact, elections might be the way to, to create change, an effective instrument for change, because they had just elected Barack Obama. When we went back a year later, right, when, when they had experienced the governing that comes with elections, uh, far fewer believe that, in fact, elections were the way to kind of effectively mobilize change. And increasingly what we see is that there was a move in particular for African Americans back to individuals, that an individual can make a difference. But you know, pretty consistently people have always thought that community organizations were an important place for, um, for change. And I think that's where, um, that's where we see kind of the growth and where people really want to be invested. Now I think I can say the last two slides very quickly. Um, millennial policy preferences, another part of this is not, we just don't want to get kids or young people to participate because, in fact, we think that's your duty or that's your right. But they're participating to advance a, a policy preference or a policy agenda. And again, the policies that they want to pursue are very different when we look at um, young people based on race and ethnicity. Right? The majority of young people support increasing the federal minimum wage, but a significant majority of African Americans or Latinos support that policy. 
I'll just jump down very quickly. You know, if you look at something like millennials and their perspectives on LGBT politics, we know that um, they, if you ask them the most important thing for LGBT communities or organizations to do, they differ. African Americans say the most important issue for LGBT organizations to pursue has to do with HIV. Uh, young whites say the most important thing for LGBT organizations to pursue is same-sex marriage. And young Latinos say the most important issue is bullying. So again, the significance of this aggregating this idea of a kind of homogenous millennial group, uh, it just seems to us to be critical. So takeaways. The takeaways are in particular that millennials, but in particular black millennials, are engaged in what we consider to be the traditional political realm. They're engaged in something we're calling the participatory politics realm. They um, feel like they have efficacy, but they feel quite alienated from the traditional political system. And they have a policy agenda that they want to see advanced that really kind of fits within the traditional political system, but they will find alternative ways to advance that uh, agenda if Congress and the President don't respond. So I think here I get to turn it oh, well, Let me see if there are any questions um, that I should answer before I turn it over to um, Scott. I think there's Kathy, a question. When measuring, yes. Yes, yes, Kathy. There is a question. When measuring uh, participatory political engagement, are you now including social media sites like Tumblr, Facebook, Twitter, in and Instagram as data sources? Yes, yes we are. And there's another project that I won't take much time uh, called Youth and Participatory Politics. You can go to that website and you can see lots of data that we have on young people going to those sites and using those sites as, as political platforms. Let me just see very, very quickly that we know that even when looking at those types of platforms, African American youth tend to be the most digitally connected and using those platforms both for um, kind of just friendship activities and interest-driven activities, but also for political activities. All right. I think I should turn it over to Scott at this point. Thank you, Kathy. Yes, yeah, Scott, the floor is yours. Great. Um, thanks so much. Really excited to be here uh, and following Kathy. I'm a, I'm a big fan of hers and the, and the Black Youth Project. Um, and so uh, I'm going to talk – so I'm the Executive Director of Generation Citizen. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the, the organization that, that we run and some more practical uh, on the ground ways that, that we're implementing to try to actually engage young people in politics. So I think it's, it's great following Kathy who has done fantastic research, identified both the problem and some potential solutions. Uh, and Generation Citizen is just one way of tackling this. There's, there's a, a lot of organizations in the space which we can talk about um, and, and we're, we're talking about one specific way of getting young people to be active citizens and, and to be politically engaged. So, this is a broad overview. Um, we work to ensure that, that every student in this country uh, receives an effective action civics education, providing them with the knowledge and skills necessary to participate uh, in our democracy. And I'll talk in a second about what action civics actually means. Um, so what GC actually does is that we work directly with schools. Um, so we have an in-school action civics curriculum. It's not implemented as, as an after-school activity. It's not uh, implemented as an extracurricular. We want this to be as prevalent uh, as math, as science, as English, as those core subjects because it's, it's that important. Uh, and ultimately, you know, we want young people banding together to, to effectively rebuild this, this democracy. So, so what is action civics? I think one of the, the reasons that we use action civics is even the term civics, you know, you bring it up um, and, and um, you know, people connote it with, here's the free branch of government, here's how a bubble comes a lot, not, not the most exciting class in school. Uh, I think people would say. And so um, we and a, a number of organizations helped form something that we called the National Action Civics Collaborative. Uh, and so there's six main things that we think are core to the work of Action Civics, um, and students uh, engage in these through our program. One is examining their own community. Uh, the second is identifying key issues, both assets and problems in their own community. Uh, the third is doing research on those issues, so actually figuring out um, you know, what's the root cause of why this is a problem? And I'll, I'll walk through some specific examples later. Um, the, the next is strategizing, um, so actually figuring out how can we take effective action on these issues. Uh, the fifth and probably the most important is actually taking action. And so I think, I mean, obviously that's, that's inherent with the phrase action civics, but we really believe that just as you learn science by doing science experiments, you learn math by doing applied math, uh, you learn English by reading, 
engaged books. Um, we want students to learn civics through doing civics. And then the, the last part, which is actually really important too, is reflection. Um, you know, political change is, is really hard. It's really tricky. It takes time. Um, and so, you know, this subject and other subjects in school, a lot of times there's a right answer and a wrong answer. Um, in, in civics, there's not. Um, and, and we have politicians that have been trying to change things for decades and haven't been successful. So how can we get young people to, to be motivated, but also to recognize that, that change uh, the change takes time. So, so Generation Citizens uh, exact approach. So we have a, a core program, um, and the core program is actually we partner college volunteers um, called Democracy Coaches with, with middle and high school teachers to co-facilitate this curriculum. We're currently located, um, we're based in New York City. We also have programs in Boston, uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, and in Rhode Island. Um, and working with almost 10,000 students in that core program through those, through those sites. Um, we also have a, a GC teacher-led model, so this is not using those college volunteers. The reason, just to go back, the reason that we use those college volunteers um, is for multiple, multiple reasons. One is this peer-to-near -peer, peer connection. It gives someone, the students someone that's a little different in the classroom, someone that they can relate to. Um, and, and the other thing is, is that there's very concrete local advocacy research that needs to be done uh, and having uh, college students in the classroom really helps um, the, the teachers with, um, with, with that aspect as well. Um, the third thing that we do is um, a community change fellowship. So at the end of the semester, this is a semester long course, we have students that are, are really engaged and really pumped up. Uh, we place them in a political civic engagement internship. It might be with an elected official, it might be with a civic engagement organization. Um, and we do uh, organizing training as, as well. Um, and the last thing we're doing is um, not enough people see, and thank you all for taking time out of your day to be on this call, but not enough people see educating our young people to be active citizens uh, as a vital component, both for their own individual development and for our democracy. Um, and this can't keep being seen as a cute program for students uh, that happens if there's enough time in the school that it needs to be seen, seen as absolutely vital. Uh, and we're engaging in various things to make that happen. I can talk through that later, um, but, but that's becoming an increasingly important part uh, of, of our work. Um, so the core program elements, just to go that in a little bit more detail. So as I said, we train uh, college democracy coaches, they're volunteers. We partner them with teachers. Um, it's, a, it's a twice weekly um, class. So it's about 20 to 25 classes over the course of the semester. Um, so it's, it's fairly lengthy. Um, it's student-centered, so this piece is, is really important. We ask the young people at the beginning of the semester, what would you change if you could change anything in your school, your city, your state? They choose the issues. The issues are issues like gang violence, teen jobs, public transit, uh, primarily focused in, in low-income schools with a lot of the populations that, that Kathy was talking about. Um, it's action-driven. They're taking real action. Uh, and then we culminate in something that we call Civics Day, um, which is like a, a science fair for, for civics, and so it's young people um, presenting the issues that they've taken action on to elected officials uh, and, um, and community leaders. Um, this is our curriculum in a nutshell. I'm happy to, if there are educators on the call, I'm happy to, to send this around afterwards. These are all the lessons. Um, you can see the, the different units that we have, which is uh, about identifying issues, um, actually planning action, and then and there's a whole suite of different tactics to, to take action on. Um, the way that, that we actually frame our, our action component is through something that we call the advocacy hourglass. And we see this as an effective way uh, of actually framing the way that, that students are going to take action. The reason that we use an hourglass, and a lot of students actually don't know what hourglasses is, I think Yahtzee and is a thing of the past, starts broad. So you can see at the top here it starts with a community issue, so that might be something like climate change or global warming, something big. Um, and then they get specific um, to a root cause of why that problem exists in the first place. Um, they figure out an exact goal of something they want to take action on, um, figure out who the targets are that can help them take action, uh, and then actual tactics uh, that need to be done to, to take concrete action. So here's an example of that. Um, so uh, a community issue might be something really big, um, like it's hard to get to school, students are feeling unsafe, there are attendance issues, so there's, there's a lot of things. You can't necessarily do anything about any of them. So we zone in. What's the focus issue? What's the very specific thing? Uh, and the students identify that safety is an issue that affects students staying after school and community home and neighborhood. So that's the problem. Students have identified that as a problem. 
So what's the root cause of this? There's numerous root causes, the ones that these students identified. So there's a lack of district and city resources providing students safe transportation if leaving after general dismissal time. This is something that happens at a lot of schools. Um, and I, I think what's important about this is that it, it's specific and it's tied uh, to local government and politics. Uh, the goal becomes advocating for school departments uh, and city funding to provide safety measures for students. Then they uh, figure out the decision maker, in this case, the superintendent and the city council, influencers that can influence that decision maker, uh, and then various tactics um, like conducting a, a petition, holding a meeting, um, and, uh, and, and actually forming a, a coalition. Really quickly, because um, I want to make sure that we have, we have ample time for Q&A, we, we do try to think about so those goals, um, just to, to cycle back for a second, you see that goal is, is right below the root cause. It's really important that they figure out a concrete goal. Um, and here are different model goals. Um, and so these are how we've identified we want the students to take effective action. Um, they're around the legislative or executive branch. They're either about influencing legislation, introducing new legislation, influencing how departments or schools use resources, or influencing how departments or schools solicit youth input. Um, so this is all really important stuff. And again, we're trying to figure out how can we get students to take effective action so they're actually excited to participate in politics to, to go back to, to some of Kathy's previous points. Um, these are, are just some, some quotes um, from, from young people that have participated in the program. And I think uh, what's noticeable about these quotes, uh, a lot of times students, um, uh, it's really about developing the skills that they need to participate as active citizens in the long term. Generation Citizen is not necessarily about um, the projects that, that young people are tackling. If they're successful, great. Um, but really it's about um, uh, the skills that they need so that they can be engaged citizens now um, and, and in the long term. And so hopefully these quotes help to illuminate that. Um, the last thing that, that I'll go over, I talked a little bit about the beginning about this, this concept of demand building. Um, and, and we, um, you know, there's a few, or there, there's, there's some organizations in this space, there need to be more organizations in this space. Um, and uh, we, about almost a year ago, put together a convening that Kathy came to, a lot of others came to, uh, about this concept of educating for democracy. And we're trying to define a broader field here. Um, you know, there's, there's some in the civic education space, there's some in action civics, youth organizing is something else, and, and, and Kathy touched on this, and there's youth participation and governance. All of these different activities need to really make the case um, that, that young people participating in politics is necessary for their own development as individuals and figuring out how they can become efficacious uh, and then also um, for, for a broader society. Um, we need um, folks to, um, uh, to, to, to actually um, become active and engaged members to, to really rebuild our democracy. Um, and so that's, um, you know, that's, that's, that's really important all around. Um, and so these are, are some identified from that convening, some of the things that we figured out that we need to do um, uh, that, that we can sort of go over is identifying uh, social, action, social action experiences that are critical for democratic engagement, identifying specific skills that are necessary for active citizenship. So, so we talked about that a little bit, and then further defining the type of civic engagement we hope to cultivate. Um, all of this stuff is ongoing, and it's an exciting time for the space because I think that given everything happening in the broader political space, people are realizing and recognizing uh, that, that now is the time that we need to, to, to begin really an urgent discussion um, on why it's so important for um, young people to participate in politics. Um, so um, I think that's, uh, that's all from, from, from my end. So I'll turn it over to, to Christina, the facilitators, um, if there are, are questions from folks as well. And um, I do have, Scott, I have a question for you in terms of the students who then could be considered alumni, Generation Citizen alumni. Do any of them ever then go on to become uh, democracy coaches after they've participated in the program in high school and now they're in various colleges? Yeah, that, that happens um, quite frequently actually. And, and that's, I mean, that's a goal um, for, for us to be creating a pipeline. Um, and so we have students all the time. You know, again, we're only in those four sites, but especially we see in places like New York City, students go through, through the program, they go into um, one of the, the, the CUNY schools like Hunter, so one of the, the city universities of New York, uh, and, and stay involved with the program. Again, and this is something that we're trying to develop as an organization. Uh, it's not necessarily about what the students are accomplishing in one semester, although that's important. It's about 
uh, building and educating them for for a lifetime of of engaged citizenship, and so that's what we're um, that's what we're really trying to do. And I will just mention that the white paper that Scott has been talking about, educating for democracy, that is available online on the Civility website where everyone got the registration information, as well as the uh, Black Millennials in America. So if you wanted to access those reports, you can do so there. Another question that I have for both Kathy and Scott is if you could, well, if you could speak a little bit about the attitudes and experiences that you see young people having in regards to the tension or balance between civility and free expression, uh, especially in terms of them either working towards action civics as a goal or, or maybe some of the things that they feel about what they're seeing in politics. So Kathy or Scott, either one of you can respond. <laughs> Whoever would like to go first. Okay. I'll, I'll say just a, 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 a few, I'll make a few comments on this. I mean, I am always a bit um, nervous about the framework of civility. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, I, I think we all have different senses of what is civil discourse, right? Um, I think for many, the civil rights movement um, was not civil discourse. Uh, I think if you look at kind of the mobilization that's happening today across the country through something we might call Black Lives Matter movement, which includes lots of different organizations, if you look at what's happening in Chicago, um, led by youth organizations like the BYP 100 in terms of the Laquan McDonald video and young people demanding uh, that the superintendent resigned, and now that the mayor resigned, I think for some people that is not civil discourse, and and so I worry sometimes that the, that the framework of civility can kind of truncate what we understand to be really meaningful and effective engagement in a political dialogue that can make us uncomfortable. Um, we know that, for example, when we look at the data of young people uh, talking about uh, their online experiences. We know that they encounter um, uh, both racist and sexist and, and other discriminatory um, discourse online. And the question becomes, how do they navigate that? Um, about over 80% of young people say when you ask them a question, would you, um, do you believe in fact that you would benefit from supports to think about not only what's credible material online, but how to handle these types of encounters, 80% of young people are saying, yes, I, I need some support. So <clears throat> I, I worry that the response to kind of questions of civility is to kind of truncate how we uh, engage with really contentious issues as opposed to building up an infrastructure so that young people have the spaces and the opportunity to really kind of struggle with what does it mean when people fundamentally disagree, and that those disagreements are sometimes rooted in very strong feelings that means that that people um, have kind of heated exchanges. That doesn't have to be um, problematic. I mean, it, it, it can be part of political discourse because things matter. Um, so, so I, you know, so we know that young people are experiencing especially online, um, exchanges that make them uncomfortable. And in part, they're uncomfortable because, in fact, they can be heated. And, and, and often, unfortunately, they, they are also in a realm with, that we would want to say is unacceptable. But I do think that part of the answer to this, and I think young people understand it, is not to shut down discourse, but in fact to provide the infrastructure to really understand and explore that discourse. And I think that's where the program that Scott is, you know, that Generation Citizen and their work is so critically important. And some of the work, for example, that we're trying to do with Chicago Public Schools, try to, you know, try to, again, provide the supports that young people need to kind of navigate um, a heated political environment. I'll, I'll let you, Scott can That's answer. That's a great answer. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think Kathy um, said it very well. I, I guess what I'd say is that um, I agree that, that maybe civility isn't the, the perfect word. I do think that um, dialogue and uh, discussion is important. And I think sometimes uh, we, and, and this is going on with the political discourse in this country, but in, in 
you know, I've spent time abroad, uh, as was talked about at the beginning, we sort of have an obsession with, in, in this country about being right and wrong and having discussions about that rather than figuring out what's right um, and, and, and what the, the truth is. And I think that actually goes to some of Kathy's points is that, you know, sometimes there are universal truths that have to be figured out and, and that's not necessarily about civility. And the political process is, helped to, is supposed to help to illuminate those truths. Um, so that's, that's a little theoretical, but I think at a concrete level for our young people, um, you know, it is about trying to reconcile some of these hard discussions, but, but they need to be able to, um, to, 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 to talk to each other. Um, but the other part of it is that we need elected officials um, that, that are capable of actually listening. Um, and so I think one of the things that we talk about is how can we get young people to actually participate in politics, and then how can we get elected officials to recognize that young voices actually matter and, and not tokenize them. Um, and I think that's an important uh, process and distinction that sometimes can be challenging. Um, and so I think you know, some of this is, it's, it's not about participating in the right way, um, but it is about um, you know, how, can we, how can we change politics um, from winning and losing, which I think in this country it just has become about, um, to, to actually moving uh, communities forward. Um, and so maybe it's not as much as we're trying to convince uh, young people to, to be civil, um, but it is about, you know, trying to make sure that, um, that, that we're having those types of conversations, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. And we actually have um, another question. Uh, what suggestions do you offer to educators and educational institutions to better support students as they venture into participatory politics or civic engagement? Uh, <clears throat> this is Kathy. I'll jump in really quickly and then Scott can take it from there. Um, so this is, a, I think, a really great question because I think there is a way in which, um, and I think Scott mentioned this, there's a way in which we say, of course we want young people to be engaged in civics and politics. But um, as educators and advocates, we really have to think about have we provided the infrastructure um, and the signals to young people to say that we, as Scott just said, we value your voice in its kind of multiple forms. So take, for example, the idea of participatory politics. It means that we are leveraging the advantages that we get from digital media. Um, but in a number of, for example, schools, public schools in Chicago, um, there is a filter in the school, which means that young people can't access the web. Now, I understand the kind of concern about um, cyberbullying, and many people have said that's been exaggerated. <clears throat> but there is a way in which I think we're sending a signal to the young people in those schools, largely black and Latino young people, that we don't trust them with this tool, so therefore we don't trust their politics um, or, or the ways in which they might engage. So I think the first thing is how do we provide access uh, in a structured manner that support the idea that this is an, an area of expertise often for young people and also a place where they can engage in, um, in expression, both expression around uh, uh, public culture, uh, kind of popular culture, but also around politics. And I think this goes back to kind of Scott's point about thinking about civics and participatory politics as something that we really want to engage and facilitate, and that means including it in our curriculum. What does a civics a curriculum from K through 12 really looks like that leverages the affordances of new media and supports the voice of young people. I mean, that's, I think, what we're, we're talking about. It, it will mean not only that we'll kind of have to provide this curriculum, but it may mean the reteaching of, of certain kind of skills for teachers. Quite often, for example, participatory politics is an uncomfortable space for educators because we have students who know more about um, kind of digital platforms than we do. It's a generational uh, issue. And that can be uncomfortable, for example, for educators. So I think if we're really kind of committed to the idea of participatory politics and civic engagement, it means a kind of deep investment, a personal investment for educators, but it also means kind of rethinking questions of access and the ways in which young people engage in the political process that don't look like how we engaged in the political process for the last 20 years. And again, uh, kind of recognizing that that is 
um, uncomfortable but can be productive. Uh, and I'll let Scott jump in. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all that. Um, I think uh, one of the things that I add there is that a lot of times educators in schools, especially in schools, are nervous. And they sort of treat politics as the third rail um, because they don't want to be controversial and um, you know, they, they, they want to milk toast it. And the problem is, is that um, young people are going to get excited about this stuff when it is real uh, and it is relevant. And so I think it's about providing educators with resources and there's a lot of good stuff out there. Um, Diana Hess, who's now the education dean at, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, has done a lot of good stuff on um, how to talk about controversial issues with students, and I think that's really important. Um, but I think from our perspective, you know, th there needs to be a, sort of a bottom-up and, and top-down approach. So there needs to be, and we're trying to do so, but we need to figure out how do we get programs out there and curriculum out there and training and professional development. That all needs to happen. And then from the top down, there needs to be uh, assessments at the city, state, and federal level um, that take this stuff into account school level, um, you know, one of the reasons that it's been hard for civics education to really gain legs um, is the extent to which there's just so many things that schools are held accountable for these days. Um, so, um, you know, how, uh, how do we make sure that this is one of those things that they're, they're held accountable for? Not in a way that um, is, you know, here the, you know, take a multiple choice test on how government works, uh, but in a more skills specific way. Um, so, um, you know, that's, um, you know, I, I guess that's, that's, that's part of it, but I think this is a question that needs to be asked. I think the last thing I'd say is that, you know, educators need to keep bringing this up. They need to make sure that they're uh, advocating for actually getting the resources from, from schools and districts that they need in order to be successful and, and to teach this. Thank you both Kathy and Scott for answering those questions. Um, I think now I will just mention that you can find all of the information that Kathy and Scott have referred to today on our Civility website. Um, and the course materials, again, are also um, accessible through the room that you're in now. And if you have any additional questions for any of us, um, our emails are up on the screen. Um, but really, I think that that is it for us today. And thank you so much to everyone who has participated and for the great questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the American Bar Association, the ABA Division for Public Education, and the ABA Center for Professional Development, thank you for participating in this program. To learn more about the sponsors, visit the ABA website at www.americanbar.org. Thank you, and please click on the evaluation link. We value your feedback.